didn't seem to have much of a uh, outward reaction this ice. Uh, what were your what were your thoughts there when uh, when uh, Mr. Beerus was uh, pronounced dead? Oh, I was very happy. This is one of my most happy days of my life. Why? It's been too long. Why were you so happy? Why? They ruined my family. On Thursday, February 7th, 1991, at approximately 5.30 p.m., Tommy Engstrom dropped off her one-year-old son at her friend's house before reporting to work at the Clover Bar in Hubbard, Ohio. Tommy's mother worked with Tommy at the Clover Bar. Tommy arrived at work at 6.30 p.m. Later, at approximately 9.30 p.m., Tommy had to leave work due to illness. Tommy's mother relieved Tommy so that she could go home early. However, instead of going directly home, Tommy drove to the Nickelodeon Lounge in Massary, Ohio, to visit her uncle who was a regular patron at that tavern. Tommy arrived at the Nickelodeon at approximately 10 p.m. She was wearing a black leather coat, a sweater, black pants, black shoes, black stockings or socks, and a $1,200 diamond cluster ring she had purchased from a friend a few weeks earlier. She was also carrying a small gray purse which, according to one witness, contained a significant amount of money. At the Nickelodeon, Tommy had several drinks and spoke with her uncle and others. Kenneth Byros arrived at the Nickelodeon at approximately 11 p.m., having earlier participated in a drinking event sponsored by the Nickelodeon and other bars. Byros knew Tommy's uncle, but was a stranger to Tommy. By midnight, Tommy had passed out, due to either sickness or intoxication, while seated at a table. She later fell off her chair and onto the floor. Her uncle and Byros helped Tommy back into her seat. At approximately 1 a.m., when the bar was closing, Byros and her uncle assisted Tommy outside to the parking lot. Tommy insisted on driving herself home, but her uncle took Tommy's car keys upon determining that she was too intoxicated to drive. Byros then volunteered to take Tommy for coffee to help sober her up. Tommy's uncle handed Tommy her purse and noticed that she was wearing her leather coat. At approximately 1.15 a.m., Byros and Tommy left the Nickelodeon in Byros's car. Tommy's uncle remained at the bar after closing and waited for Byros to return with Tommy. However, Byros never returned Tommy to the Nickelodeon. Meanwhile, on February 7th, at approximately 11.30 p.m., Tommy's husband Andy went to the Clover Bar to deliver a gift he had bought for Tommy. However, Tommy's mother informed Andy that Tommy had left work and had gone home sick. Andy drove home and discovered that Tommy was not there. Andy then asked the babysitter to continue watching Casey while he went out to search for Tommy. At approximately 1 a.m., Andy spoke with Tommy's sister who suggested that Tommy might have gone to the Nickelodeon. At 1.10 a.m., Andy called the Nickelodeon and was told that Tommy and her uncle had already left the bar. Andy then went to sleep, assuming that Tommy would soon return home. When he awoke later that morning, he discovered that Tommy was still missing. On Friday, February 8th, 1991, at or about noon, Andy and a friend went to the Nickelodeon to pick up Tommy's car, which had been left there overnight. At some point, Andy learned that Byros had been the last person seen with Tommy. Therefore, Andy drove to Byros's home and confronted Byros concerning Tommy's whereabouts. Byros told Andy that after he and Tommy had left the Nickelodeon to get coffee, he tapped her on the shoulder and she freaked out, got out of the car and started running through these people's yards on Davis Street in Sharon, 
Pennsylvania. The location where Byros claimed that Tommy had jumped from the vehicle was approximately three-tenths of a mile from the Nickelodeon. Andy told Byros that he had already contacted the police in Sharon, Pennsylvania, and that he intended to file a missing persons report with the Brookfield Township Police Department. Andy told Byros that if she don't turn up right fast, they are going to come looking for you and it's going to be your ass. Throughout the day on Friday, February 8th, Byros told a number of witnesses similar stories concerning Tommy's disappearance. Specifically, he told Tommy's mother, Tommy's brother, Tommy's uncles, her friends, acquaintances, and others, that after he had left the Nickelodeon with Tommy, she woke up, became frightened, jumped from his vehicle, and ran between houses near Carpenter's Towing or Carpenter's Garage on Davis Street in Sharon, Pennsylvania. Byros also indicated that he had initially chased after Tommy, but that he had been unable to catch her. Byros told a number of these witnesses that he had abandoned the chase to avoid being caught while driving under the influence of alcohol. Several of the witnesses noticed fresh cuts or scratches on Byros's hands, and a fresh wound over his right eye that had not been present the night before. Byros explained that he had cut his hands, because he had been locked out of his house and had to break a window, and that he had obtained the cut above his eye while chopping wood. Tommy's brother threatened to kill Byros if Tommy had been hurt in any way. One of Tommy's uncles told Byros that if Tommy had been hurt, he would rip your heart out. Tommy's mother told Byros, if you put one scratch on my daughter, I will kill you. Byros tried to comfort her by telling her, don't worry. Your daughter is going to be just fine. You wait and see. On Friday evening, Byros helped Tommy's relatives search the area in Sharon. Pennsylvania, where he claimed to have last seen Tommy. Byros lived on King Graves Road in Brookfield Township, Ohio, with his mother and his brother. On Friday morning, February 8th, Byros's mother found a gold ring on the bathroom floor. The next day, she asked Byros if he knew anything about the ring. Byros claimed to know nothing about it. Byros told his mother that the ring appeared to be made of cheap gold. When Byros's mother responded that the ring was not cheap, Byros suggested that perhaps it had belonged to the girl who jumped out of his car early Friday morning. Byros then took the ring and said that he would return it to the Nickelodeon. However, Byros never returned Tommy's ring to the Nickelodeon. Rather, according to Byros, he hid the ring in the ceiling of his house. On Friday night, Byros's brother was at home watching television, while Byros was outside in a pasture behind the house. He went outside and called to Byros to see what he was doing. Byros responded that he was watching stars. His brother then returned to the house and retired for the evening. On Saturday, February 9th, Tommy's family and friends spent hours searching for Tommy in Sharon, Pennsylvania. They also searched a wooded area along the railroad tracks near Byros's home on King Graves Road. However, the search party was unable to uncover any clues concerning Tommy's disappearance. On Saturday afternoon, police called Byros's home and left a message requesting that he come to the police station for questioning. After receiving the message, Byros drove to the police station to discuss Tommy's disappearance with Brookfield Township and Sharon, Pennsylvania police officers. Police informed Byros that he was not under arrest and that he was free to leave at any time. During questioning, Byros reiterated the same basic story that he had previously told Tommy's friends and relatives. Specifically, 
Byros told police that he had left the Nickelodeon with Tommy in the early morning hours of February 8 to get coffee or food at some location in Sharon, Pennsylvania. Byros claimed that Tommy had passed out in his vehicle after they left the Nickelodeon. Byros told police that he stopped at an automated teller machine to withdraw some money and, at that point, Tommy woke up and insisted that Byros drive her back to the Nickelodeon. Byros told police that as he was driving on Davis Street in Sharon, Pennsylvania, Tommy jumped from the vehicle and ran away. When asked whether Tommy's purse might have been left in his vehicle, Byros responded that he had thoroughly cleaned the vehicle and had found no purse. At some point during the interview, Captain John Claric of the Sharon Police Department began questioning Byros's version of the story. Claric suggested to Byros that perhaps Byros had made some sexual advance toward Tommy which, in turn, may have caused her to jump from the vehicle. Byros denied making any sexual advances. In the early morning hours of Sunday, February 10, 1991, Pennsylvania and Ohio authorities discovered several of Tommy's severed body parts in a desolate wooded area of Butler County, Pennsylvania. Police found other portions of Tommy's body in a desolate wooded area of Venango County, Pennsylvania, approximately 30 miles north of the Butler site. Tommy's head and right breast had been severed from her torso. Her right leg had been amputated just above the knee. The body was completely naked except for what appeared to be remnants of black leg stockings that had been purposely rolled down to the victim's feet or ankles. The torso had been cut open and the abdominal cavity was partially eviscerated. The anus, rectum, and all but a small portion of her sexual organs had been removed from the body and were never recovered by police. Forensic Technicians Police and homicide investigators searched the area of the railroad tracks near King Graves Road where Byros had indicated that the incident with Tommy occurred. There, investigators discovered a large area of blood-stained gravel near the railroad tracks. Investigators also found blood spatters on the side of one of the steel tracks. A number of other blood stains were found in the same general area. Blood stains and swabbings of blood collected at the scene were later tested and were found to be consistent with Tommy's blood. Additionally, investigators found what appeared to be part of the victim's intestines in a swampy area near the railroad tracks. DNA testing revealed that the intestines were, in fact, part of Tommy's remains. Byros was convicted of aggravated murder, attempted rape, aggravated robbery and felonious sexual penetration and sentenced to death. Byros was executed by lethal injection on December 8, 2009, at 11 a.m. at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville, Ohio. In the last night and morning of his life, Kenneth Byros drank cup after cup of water. 12 in all, perhaps hoping to ensure that he was hydrated so that his executioners could more easily access his veins to kill him. Whether the extra water had anything to do with it or not, Byros died quietly at 11.47 m about 10 minutes after a single, large dose of the opental sodium, a powerful anesthetic, flowed into his left arm. He is the first person in U.S. history to be put to death using a single drug. His last meal was, cheese pizza, onion rings and fried mushrooms, chips with French onion dip, cherry pie, blueberry ice cream and a Dr. Pepper soft drink. His final words were, I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart. I want to thank all of my family and friends for my prayers and who supported and believed in me. My father, now I'm being paroled to heaven. I will now spend all of my holidays with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peace be with you all. Amen. 
The execution marked the second time in three years Ohio has revised the method. Lethal injection was questioned in 2006 after a man who was supposed to be unconscious suddenly struggled and said the drugs were not working. Ohio then created a set to die revision requiring the warden to call out the condemned man's name and shake and pinch his shoulder to ensure unconsciousness after the sedative was administered. Byros was the 51st person executed in the United States in 2009 and the 5th in Ohio that year. Thank you for watching Death Row.